In 1981, our critics charged that letting you keep more of your earnings would trigger an inflationary explosion, send interest rates soaring, and destroy our economy. Well, well we cut your tax rates anyway. Well, by nearly 25%. And what that helped trigger was falling inflation, falling interest rates, and the strongest economic expansion in 30 years. Capitalist realism. It seems like such a neutral concept. It seems like it's just a constellation of words that describes how you can buy a snack before going to school. It just describes how free trade is actually part of your everyday life. And yet, it's a malign concept. It's one that pervades everything you think and do. So let's talk about it. Capitalist realism is a concept brought to life again by theorist and philosopher Mark Fisher. It describes the widespread sense that the only viable political economic way to organize a society is through capitalism. This notion, however, quickly transforms into a more radical proposition. People are literally unable to imagine any other coherent way of organizing society. Fisher sees in capitalism something resembling more a fluid than a monolithic structure. Its plasticity is astonishing. He takes this view from philosophers Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. Fisher writes, When it actually arrives, capitalism brings with it a massive desacralization of culture. It is a system which is no longer governed by any transcendent law. On the contrary, it dismantles all such codes only to reinstall them on an ad hoc basis. The limits of capitalism are not fixed by fiat, but defined and redefined pragmatically and improvisationally. Fisher goes on to say that capitalism is a monstrous, infinitely plastic entity capable of metabolizing and absorbing anything with which it comes into contact. Beyond Deleuze and Guattari, Fisher is intellectually indebted to Frederick Jameson, who describes the workings of postmodern capitalism in his book Postmodernism, or The Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. What Fisher draws on is Jameson's notion of the schizophrenic subject. According to Jameson, we've lost our ego in the postmodern age due to the schizophrenic nature of capitalism. We're no longer unified, but rather, we're fragmented. In psychoanalysis, schizophrenia is a breaking down of a unified meta-narrative, the I. It's a breakdown of the signifying chain. The schizophrenic is multiplicitous and makes connections. This leads to the postmodern trademark Fisher focuses on the most, the weakening of history. And due to the opening up of the ego, we experience time differently. Jameson argues that this breakdown in signifiers reduces us to the present moment. The signifying chain is syntagmic. It's a sequential series of signifiers on a horizontal axis. And when this chain breaks down, signifiers scramble the codes. A rubble of distinct and unrelated signifiers appears. And since, as Jameson writes in the prison house of language, personal markers and distinctions like consciousness, personality, the subject, etc. are deemed secondary phenomena are determined by the vaster structure of language itself, what is called the symbolic order, this means we can draw parallels to the unconscious. Personal identity is an effect of a unification of the past and future with one's present. And if we can't unify the past, present and future of a sentence, we can't unify the past, present and future of our own biographical experience of life. That means, as Jameson puts it, we are reduced to an experience of pure material signifiers, or a series of pure and unrelated presence in time. Well, I thank you for your question, uh, but I have to say we're capitalists. And that's just the way it is. Despite owing a lot to Jameson and maintaining the substitution of the neurotic for the schizophrenic, Fisher argues that capitalist realism and postmodernism are different on especially three accounts. One, when Jameson advanced his argument of postmodernity in the 1980s, there were still viable alternatives to capitalism, or at least it seemed so. Fisher writes that the last battles in Britain between workers and capitalists took place in this decade, and the losses of the working class made capitalism cross the threshold from postmodernity to realism. Two, postmodernism was entangled in modernism. Postmodernism responded to and incorporated modernism 
in various ways. There remained a connection between them. Fisher describes how modernism's seemingly top-down approach to culture was deterritorialized by postmodernity and then re-territorialized into democratization, difference, multiplicity, and diversity. Whereas something of modernism remained in postmodernism, capitalist realism takes the vanquishing of modernism for granted. Modernism is reduced to an aesthetic style, it's frozen in time. And three, a whole generation has passed since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Back then, capitalism had to work out how it had to capture externality, how it had to incorporate, absorb and manage energy from outside itself. Now, however, capitalism faces the opposite task. Having absorbed everything from the outside, how can it continue to function without an outside to colonize and appropriate? This is perhaps the most radical and important change to capitalism. And Fisher writes something ominous, that for most people under the age of 20 back in 2009, capitalism occupies the horizons of what is thinkable. It has seeped into our unconscious. And this is a major point. Capitalist realism doesn't work in the boom and bust cycle of detournement and recuperation like the postmodern capitalism did, like modernism did before it. It operates through something Fisher names pre-corporation. He writes, What we are dealing with now is not the incorporation of materials that previously seemed to possess subversive potentials, but instead their pre-corporation, the preemptive formatting and shaping of desires, aspirations and hopes by capitalist culture. Every single desire, every single thought, every single emotion, every act, everything is enmeshed in capitalism. And not only that, your desires, thoughts, emotions, actions, all of them are capitalistic before you even have them or perform them. Fisher mentions how predicates such as alternative or independent don't point to something opposed to the mainstream, but are rather the most mainstream styles as of now. He writes about Cobain's deadlock, how Kurt Cobain was locked in chains of air. No matter what he did, he was capitalized on. His actions were anticipated, even if he scathingly critiqued the system, there were always records and merchandise to sell. Cobain's greatest spectacles against the system were absorbed from before they were even made. What, what are these people good at? They're just good at making money. And that should be enough reward, right? If you want to make, if that's what you want to devote your life to, just fucking do it. But don't expect us to also admire you and just, you know, and, and um, the, you be the model for everybody else all the time. Mark Fisher presents capitalist realism through especially two poignant examples, mental health and bureaucracy. As we will witness, these two may present a way out of the system too. I just want to spend time with one of them, this is mental health, because that's the one closest to me. Mental health is largely something that's exacerbated by capitalism. Fisher turns a lot of our most commonly held assumptions about mental health on their heads. Firstly, he argues that capitalism triggers certain mental illnesses. Fisher writes that mental illnesses if that's even something you can talk of outside of capitalist realism, are instantiated neurologically through genetics, but that leaves their causation unexplained. Fisher writes, If it is true, for instance, that depression is constituted by low serotonin levels, what still needs to be explained is why particular individuals have low levels of serotonin. This requires a social and political explanation, and the task of repoliticizing mental illness is an urgent one, if the left wants to challenge capitalist realism. Furthermore, Fisher argues that the way we treat mental illness currently is of huge benefit to capitalist realism. We confine it to only being about biology, about chemicals in the brain, and have in turn depoliticized the matter completely. This has two benefits for capital, according to Fisher. The first one being what he calls the reinforcement of capitalism's drive towards atomistic individualization. It removes any mention of micropolitics of desire and class struggle and accuses the mentally ill person of being sick solely because of their own brain chemistry. It singles people out for easier treatment and corrodes a larger sense of societal solidarity. The second benefit is how this treatment of mental health opens up a huge market for pharmaceuticals. If the problem is the individual's brain chemistry, then we can treat it via medicine, mainly pills, and then sell them at a big profit. Why did you come here? Because I tried to commit suicide. Yes, I knew that, of course. But what I don't know is, 
why you tried to do this. Could you tell us how you did it? I took an overdose of pills. A hundred, didn't you? A hundred, yes. And why did you want to commit suicide? Because I didn't want to face anything. So, amidst all of this bleakness, how do we combat capitalist realism? How do we combat the blockage of the new? How do we combat the capture of innovation? Mark Fisher himself suggests tormenting capitalism with its real. The real is one of the registers psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan introduces in his writings. The real is something which insists, which has causality, but doesn't exist. There's two ways for us to evade the real. One is through symbolization. We try to put it into words. We try to capture a version of it using language. The other is setting up a fantasy, a screen, so that the real gets to us in a changed and processed form through an image. So again, what are these reals of capitalist realism? Fisher talks of three of them, the environment, mental health and bureaucracy. The environment is a quirky one because everyone knows climate change is happening. And that goes for the rich people as well, they just don't acknowledge it. And everyone knows that resources are being depleted and if carried out, there's a threat on organized human life. These things are not repressed, as Fisher writes, they're being incorporated actively into advertising and marketing. You can buy cars that run on electricity and even electricity from environmentally friendly sources. Fisher even points out how capitalism knows of all of this in the film Wall E, where this concern over the environment is the plot's major focal point. However, argues Fisher, environmental catastrophe only bubbles up in capitalism as a sort of simulacra where its real ramifications are too traumatic to be truly assimilated into the system. Fisher argues how so-called green critiques are starting to question capitalism in ways we can't do elsewhere. Capitalism needs to grow. It's opposed to any notion of sustainability and green critiques seem to have influenced more people, especially young people, to spark action. Green critiques strain the system. The second reel that Fisher mentions is mental health, which we've already discussed a bit. It's not as politicized as the environment, but there lies a lot of potential in the issue. As mentioned before, treating mental health as we do now, as a natural fact taking form in an individual psyche, is beneficial to capitalism. Fisher's response to it is a call to politicization of common disorders and to highlight their very commonness. Fisher writes, Instead of treating it as incumbent on individuals to resolve their own psychological distress, instead, that is, of accepting the vast privatization of stress that has taken place over the last 30 years, we need to ask, how has it become acceptable that so many people, and especially so many young people, are ill? The mental health plague in capitalist societies would suggest that, instead of being the only social system that works, capitalism is inherently dysfunctional, and at the cost of it appearing to work is very high. The last reel that Fisher mentions is the reel of bureaucracy. He goes on to saying that a reinvigorated left should offer a solution of how to rid society of bureaucracy in ways neoliberalism never could. Bureaucracy has changed from the Stalinist days. Today it's all about measuring outcomes, assessing productivity. It's about aims and objectives and writing mission statements that need to be followed through on. Capitalist realism's bureaucracy bogs everyone down. It sends them into endless loops. It makes them do redundant things. It makes them simulate productivity. It's easy to look at capitalist realism and to be disheartened. It's easy to see a cycle of spectacle after spectacle and to hate it furiously. If we're already tinged by capitalism before we even think, how do we work against that? How do we effectively fight something that possesses us in such a way? Well, allow me to bring to you Fisher's closing paragraph. The long dark night of the end of history has to be grasped as an enormous opportunity. The very oppressive pervasiveness of capitalist realism means that even glimmers of alternative political and economic possibilities can have a disproportionately great effect. The tiniest event can tear a hole in the grey curtain of reaction which has marked the horizons of possibility under capitalist realism. From a situation in which nothing can happen, suddenly anything is possible again. 
And innovations are already created which, in time, will hollow out capitalist realism. There seems to be more attunement to the workers' plight. In the US, more people are open to higher taxes on the rich and even to notions of universal health care, which is a running feature through many of the democratic candidate platforms. Likewise, in various fields of humanity, there's huge turns toward new and experimental movements propelled by a call to an interdisciplinary approach. And even in culture, we have new videos, films and series emerging, which push against the cage of air that is capitalist realism. And who can forget musical acts such as Death Grips and Clipping, who make music that doesn't sound like it came from the 90s, but from the future. Thank you all for watching, I greatly appreciate your support. A huge thank you to Simran Samara and Indirect Existence for supporting the channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you all next time. Bye Felicia!